may be seated. Our gospel lesson today comes from the continuing readings in the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning in the 35th verse. Listen for the word of God. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, Do you know what you are asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, I will, you will drink. And with the baptism with I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at the right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who, with whom it has been, for whom it has been prepared. You would think I never did this before. <laughs> is it just me? <laughs> when the 10 had heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. I don't know if there's one place or another I could thank you enough, but I'll try it here to say thank you for the honor of serving as your pastor, the joy and the privilege of serving as your pastor for these 25 years. You have all blessed my life, every single one of you, in one way or another, and I'm forever grateful. I have been the luckiest man alive to serve this church for this quarter century, so thank you. And thanks for last night. I still am trying to figure out what happened, but it was fun. <laughs> so, it was amazing, and I'm so grateful to Jen Provenzano and the whole crew of uh, folks that put together a glorious evening at the Art Museum. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Some people are born to run. Others are born to hurdle, to vault, to jump, to leap, to throw, or to put. That's what shot putters are doing, they're putting. In other words, in track and field, some people excel in a multitude of events because of their skills, their strength, their fortitude, their endurance, all these things that they possess and they bring to the track and the field. I am not, nor have I ever been one of them. Born to run, not me, hurdle, vault, jump, leap, throw, or put, don't look for me to help. Nevertheless, in the spring of 1974, at North Penn High School in Lansdale, Pennsylvania, I went out for track and field, along with a lot of gifted athletes. So what does a coach do with the least talented person on the team? Well, Coach Gulick put me in the two mile because I don't know why I'd run cross country so he thought he can run a long way, maybe I'll put him there. So it was the two mile. But I discovered that running through fields, through woods and rolling hills in Southeast Pennsylvania was much different than running eight laps around a track. When our first stool mate arrived, we lined up for the two mile. 
The gun fired, we took off. I labored through the laps, getting dizzy running so many ovals over and over and over. And then I was coming down to the line for the seventh lap of eight laps and the crowd rises in the stands. And there was a great crowd that day. They started clapping and I thought, this is a great race to run. These folks are so supportive, they're so amazing. They're on their feet at the beginning of our last lap. And then it happened. Jeff Kinsey flew by me, finishing the race, of course, in first place. Jeff had lapped me. I still had a lap to run and the race was over. I mean, what do you do, right? <laughs> we didn't have personal best back then, Lila, so it wasn't like I was gonna run for my personal best. We didn't do that then. So I kept running. I was running in an event, and I would for 10 more meets, in which the captain of my team, a member of my church, and my two-mile teammate was the fastest man in the two-mile in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> The cheers were not for anyone but the soon-to-be state champion, Jeff Kinsey. By the time I reached the finish line, the track officials were nervously looking at their wristwatches, not their stopwatches, <laughs> knowing they had to clear the track for the next event. They had to get everybody off so they could run the hurdles, right? And I was just literally holding everybody up. By the time I reached the finish line, all of the fans were gone and gathered around Jeff, who was very calm and relaxed by then because he had a whole quarter mile to catch his breath. There were no cheers, nothing but people nervously waiting on the edges to set the hurdles in their appropriate positions for the next race, which I was causing a delay for. Now, that would have been the day to quit track. That should have been the day to quit track. That would have been the day that I could retire from running and no one would notice. But, unfortunately, I am a hard-headed German-American Christian. I was not designed to be a runner. I was also not designed to quit. It is not in the DNA of our family to quit. If you met my ancestors, you would know that not one of them was a quitter, not one. And I thank my mom from 500 miles away for giving this gift of character from her side of the family. Dad, I'm wearing your tie today to thank you up in heaven for your side of the family. We are warriors. Some of us are warriors in war, some of us are warriors in peace, but all of us are warriors for what is right and fair and just, and we will fight for what is right and true and honest and just. My people weren't necessarily fast, I think that's fair to say, but they all ran with perseverance against all odds. The great cloud of witnesses that have surrounded me and uplifted me all the days of my life have no quit in them, and neither do I. Besides all my ancestors, my most important inspiration of all has always been Jesus my savior and my pace setter in life. He truly has been the pioneer and perfecter of my faith. Jesus who laid his life down for those that he loved rather than run away and head into the hills of Galilee. Jesus who walked and taught and healed people rather than taking a ship across the Mediterranean to some nice island and staying there for fun. Stayed with the people that he loved and cared for them. Jesus who faced his accusers and spoke the truth in love rather than giving in to the ridicule and bullying of others. Like my ancestors before me, I follow Jesus, and he never quit. He has always inspired me, and most importantly, I pray and hope he inspires you to fight the good fight, to stay disciplined, keep training and running, even when you are running on empty. Fifty years ago in the spring of 1974, with Jesus in my head and heart, although he abandoned my legs and feet, I started to work harder. I started to train harder. I reset my goals, my aspirations for the two mile. 
which mercifully, I thank Coach Gulick for putting me only in one race, and I think the rest of the team thanked him too. It was my only event, so I had to do something, right? So on the weekends after church, I would run two and three and four miles on my own to get ready for the week ahead. We didn't have things, like I said, that were personal bests. We either had winners or losers, and I was the biggest loser in the two mile. So that goal was set. My goal for the rest of the season was simple. I would not be lapped by Jeff Kinsey again. Guess what? It didn't happen all at once. But by the sixth meet, I had outrun Jeff, which means I had finished my seventh lap as he was coming to the finish line. So I had reached what we call in football the line to gain. For seven laps, I had won the race. This time he didn't run past me, but after he finished behind me, I mean, he did run eight laps, but after he finished behind me, I started skipping. Now back then, this would have been a great sort of thing to put out there on a meme of Tim Aaron skipping the eighth lap all the way to the finish line. But I was happy. When the season ended, my friend, my mentor, my church mate, my hero in the art of running the two mile, and my senior captain, the two mile champion for the state of Ohio in 1974, told me how proud he was of me. Jeff said, you never quit. You just kept running with perseverance. I'd never really heard that word before. It never landed on me. But those words of affirmation may have been the kindest, most powerful words this young man ever received at an early age. You never quit. You run with perseverance. They were words that I've hung on to ever since. This morning, runners made their way not only up Broad Street, going east on Broad, but then they came back running down Broad Street, west on Broad, as they were running the marathon. They were in wheelchairs by the hundreds. 7,000 were running the full marathon. 11,000 in the half marathon came in front of First Church, and I don't know that one of them stopped to look. It says, enter to worship, depart to serve. They were focused on the next step, the next breath. It was 48 degrees out there when they started, and people were racing and rolling and running and jogging and skipping and walking east on Broad. And by the end, I'm sure more were walking, and quite a few were limping, and probably even a few were crawling to the finish line. But they were all moving with perseverance. Running is mentioned 65 times in the Bible. It's associated with strength and discipline and endurance and suffering and patience and faith and encouragement and hope and always perseverance. Although it only appears once in Scripture, running with perseverance, Hebrews 12 says it all. The author offers a determined challenge to the faithful. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. And by the way, sons of Zebedee, that's why there wasn't a place on the right or the left, because Jesus was there. He couldn't tell you that at the time, but that's what was brewing. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Don't grow weary, don't lose heart, ever, ever. What about you? Are you going to run the race that is set before you? Are you going to move forward with perseverance? Or in the words of Jesus in Mark, are you going to humble yourselves and be a servant to all? Running with perseverance has a special quality since perseverance itself has a special quality. It comes from the Latin, and it's rooted in tenacity and endurance and steadfastness and constancy. To move with perseverance has all of the makings of victory 
in the very first step. Even though you might not ever finish what you're running, you take it with the first step and you move with meaning. It gives everything that you have, all the things that you do, it gives meaning to everything you do. Running is the means, perseverance is the ends. So, Aurelia, on your baptismal day, and Hazel, and Benton, and Rylan, and Emran, to all the children here today, I want you all to move through your life with perseverance. Do it with all the fight, all the gusto, everything you've got in you. Give everything you have to everything you do and everyone you love. To everyone here, I just want you to remember that if you can't run, skip. That's what I did. If you can't skip, walk. If you can't walk, waddle. If you can't waddle, roll. If you can't roll, crawl. And if you can't crawl, then move to the field events. Vault, <laughs> jump, leap, throw, and put. My favorite. And if you can't do that, then dive in a pool, swim somewhere, do something, but keep moving. Move forward, never retreat, never move backward. Don't wish for the good old days because those good old days aren't as good as you think they are. And don't wallow in the hard times you've gone through. Move, move forward. Move into the better days ahead. Days of God's creating, days of possibility, days of hope. Keep moving forward. First Church, move forward. Move into a brighter future. Lead us as a community into the pathways of justice for all. Move us along the paths of caring for those in need. Don't wait for someone else to move you. Move yourself. And as you do, may our God always and forever be the guide of your steps. May the Holy Spirit be the power pushing you and pulling you forward. Move with perseverance into the future that is set before you. And look to Jesus. He's out there. He wants you to be a part of the perfection of the faith. He wants you to be a part of pioneering in the work of faith that we do, and to do it all with love. To do it all with love. So I'm done. This is it. I love you all. Just keep.